I used to take my entertainment very seriously. I loved music. I loved uh, movies. Um, I picked movies apart. I, I'd strip them down to their core. I, I'd find out who uh, the grip was, who, who the best boy was. I would just shred them to pieces to find out exactly who and what made that which was tickling my fancy at the time. Years ago, there is a, an obscure, a bit of an obscure movie. Uh, I don't know what its rating is, so if it's rated R, God forgive me. I mentioned a rated R movie in here one day that you should, might watch it. It would be interesting. And people just flipped. Do you know, can I just say this real quick? Do you know if they went to rate the Bible today, it would be triple X? Rape, murder, incest. The, the Bible is one of the most bloody books on the planet. Why? It's not because God condones all of those things. He records them. As I had uh, Brother Shannon read the two verses that we've been bouncing back and forth on, these things were written for our examples. These things were written for our learning. So you say, well, you know, the Bible condones slavery. No, it doesn't. It comments on slavery. A system, by the way, the Bible, nor God made up, but instead mankind imposed upon each other. So get over yourself. <laughs> so that being said, uh, there, one of my family's favorite movies is the movie Gattaca. <laughs> that was my son. And uh, it, it stars Ethan Hawke and Jude Law. And uh, it's a fascinating film commentary of modernity but there's a, a a parable in it that uh that ethan Hawke's character tells he was uh what they would call in the movie a natural born citizen meaning that or a love born citizen meaning that his dna was not uh manipulated but he had a brother whose dna was manipulated the brother was faster the brother was stronger the brother was smarter the brother was better looking well, Ethan Hawke's character in the movie assumes one of these manipulated identities. And one day, he uh, tells his brother about the only failure that he had, his brother's failure. They had both been competing in swimming, and Ethan Hawke had, I think, asthma or a breathing ailment. And... Uh, they would compete in the swimming, and they'd always swim out to a rock. And halfway through, Ethan Hawke's character would stop and swim back uh, because he just was afraid. Well, one day he beats his brother. His brother, who was the epitome of all things, 
And his brother from that point on suffered horrible uh, self-esteem problems. And he couldn't understand how this inferior brother, love child, could have beat him. And Ethan Hawke, you know what he tells his brother? He says, do you know why I beat you that day? And he says, no. What was your secret? What did you do? He said, I saved nothing for the swim back. I saved nothing for the swim back. He gave all to do all and to be all and to win that which he had set before him. Today we're going to be talking about four soils and three servants. I pray to God that you may find yourself amongst the good soil. Today I'm going to be scattering the seed, the word of God. The good news that you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in wonderment. You don't have to live in any kind of travail in your heart and your mind if you would just receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, you mean there's not going to be troubles in my life? It's going to be perfect from here on out? No. What I mean is, is this. You will never worry about dying again. Your sins can be forgiven. Guilt can be shed like so much skin from a snake. And instead, you can become a new creation in Christ, born again today. But see, you got to be counted as the good soil to receive that kind of word and have it do any work in your life whatsoever. You say, well, maybe I'm not the good, maybe I'm not the good soil. God made me bad soil. A, that's debatable. And B, I would just say, Choose them. Choose to be the good soil today. Here in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I got it backwards. Go back to Mark. Go back to Mark chapter 4. Because we're going to talk about the soils first, then the servants. Mark chapter 4, we're starting in verse 3. As Jesus is teaching his doctrine, Mark chapter 4 and verse 3, Jesus says, Hark, and behold, there went out a sower to sow. The man had a bag full of seeds. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Now, that's one soil. By the wayside is one soil. And some may say, well, you know, why was he so willy-nilly about where he threw the seed? You know why? Because I believe God gives everybody an equal opportunity to repent and receive Jesus Christ. So he's not being willy-nilly, but he is scattering the seed, the Word of God, plentifully, like they carpet-bombed Europe in World War II, so that all are without excuse. He says, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured up. The fowls of the air, well, you can count that as probably the devil. Uh, the seed lands on the hard side of the road, the hardness of your heart, and immediately the devil comes in, and what does he say? He says, you don't need any of that. That ain't for you. You just keep, the, you keep on going the way you're going. It's going to be just fine. He says, yes, it fell to the ground, and some fell by the stony ground. Now, this is interesting, because invariably, uh, stony ground has pockets for seed to lay. And some, some fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. Now, look here. These are the ones that come forward. They give their life to Jesus Christ today, and then tomorrow, because really... The seed has not embedded in their heart. Go right back to their old life. Why? Because they have no roots in Christ. Because what has happened is they have received the word gladly. But then when the word begins to germinate, it has nothing to implant itself on. There has been no real commitment. There is no real love. Can I tell you something? If you receive Jesus Christ just to get out of hell, that's not going to fly. 
Because if you don't love him now, and you enter, you were to enter his kingdom, heaven would be hell for you. That's right. If you don't learn to love Jesus Christ, if you don't come into this relationship fully rooted in him now, even if God, by some odd unbiblical chance, were to receive you in heaven, heaven would be hell to you. In the midst of almighty, all-loving, all-holy God, you would find yourself, you would find yourself misplaced. And you would not fit in. Heaven would be hell. But when the sun was up, it says about this one that fell upon the stony ground. When the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up, and the thorns choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Now we know uh, through Jesus' own, own uh, uh, translation of this parable that the thorns are likened to the cares of the world. Had a man on our website this week. Please pray for me and my family and pray that the COVID could go away so I could finally come back to church. Listen to me. I am not criticizing nor am I shaming anybody who is still concerned about the COVID. But we have done all but that is humanly possible except for shutting the doors to remain safe and clean. And if you're not, what's wrong with you? Wash your hands. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. I say amen to all that stuff. But see, it's the cares of the world that this ground, the thorny ground, represents. They, these are the ones that will say, well, Jesus, help me to give what I can. Help you to give what you can? You can do nothing. But see, I've got this bill and I've got that bill. Hold on a second. You earned those bills and you never once asked God if you should buy those things. See, what you can do is get yourself in trouble. What Jesus can do is deliver you from that. But because of the cares of the world, these come to church and they'll say things like, well, see, I knew it. All he wants is our money. That's a care of the world. You know, I don't care about money. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm not stupid. I know God uses money to get things done. The Bible even says in Ecclesiastes, money answereth all things. Ah, uh, But God uses money to answer these things. It's God that answers them. Ah, uh, but money is just a tool. You know, I've had so much fun these last four weeks at my, at my garage sales because, again, I just don't care. They'll walk up, and i got a half-empty gallon of bleach, right? I'm like, I don't, not, I'm not moving this. I'm not going to pour it out. They'll say, what do you want for this? I said, one dollar. One dollar for a half-empty bottle of bleach? What, are you crazy? Ah, crazy like a fox. Because then they turn, they turn to the play set that my wife bought for $300, and they say, how much for the play set? I say, five bucks. Five bucks? What, are you crazy? I'm crazy like a fox. You know why? Because if they'll give me a dollar for the bleach, I know I can get them for the other six for the, uh, for the playground set. But it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Because it doesn't really matter. God's going to take care of me. He always has, and he always will. How he does it? It's up to him. He's done it so far with the 99 Dodge Caravan that I ride like a stallion. You bet. I'm a minivan man. Why? Because I can. That rhymes and I like it. No, the, the, the cares of the world take away the good news of Jesus Christ because they crowd it out and they cause pain to that soil. And others fell on good ground. If you're good ground in here, say Amen. Amen. Then why aren't you bearing fruit? Mm. We'll save that for the next stanza of Scripture in the last 20 minutes. He says, And others fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and some 60 and some 100 fold. Now, here, here's, here's a mystery to me. This is a mystery from the depths of the heart and mind of God. Why does one, why does one produce fruit 30 and 40, 60 and 100 fold? I don't know. What's the difference? I don't know. 
uh, I, I guess it's just, I, I, I don't want to say it's a level of devotion that the good soil has. I, I don't want to say it's the, it's the level of nutrients that God puts into the soil. I, I guess all I will say is it may be related to the, the level and the amount of gratitude that the soil receives the word of God. Why do I say that? Because there was one who came and broke open the spike nard, the box, the alabaster box, over the feet of our Lord and Savior, and anointed his feet with a year's worth of wages, and washed his feet in her tears, and dried him with her hair. And they looked in marvel and said, Who is this that allows a sinner such as this to touch his feet? And Christ rebukes them and says, I am not come to make the sick well or the wealthy rich. He says, But to those who are forgiven much, much gratitude is shown. I, I would imagine that those that produce the most fruit were the ones that were most convinced of their depravity, their lostness, and their desolation without what God had said about them. That's what God's Word is. God's Word is what He says about you. He says, you were made in my image. He says, you have fallen. He says, but I didn't set you up to fall, but I allowed you to fall out of my mercy and grace that I might set you up if you want me. The choice is yours. What kind of ground are you today? There are four soils. Only one of the soils in here is good soil. Now, if we went on this didactically, we could say that only one out of four people hearing the Word of God actually gets saved. Should we number ourselves one, two, three, four, and have the fourth one stand up? There's no need for that. We number ourselves amongst the believers, the seekers, the finders of Jesus Christ. If you're here today looking for truth, know this. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except by Him. Period. End of story. And if you want Him, you can have Him. Because He wants you. He wants you. You say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know how you can interpret the scripture that said God desires that all men be saved. I don't know how you can interpret that and not know that that's why the preachers and the men of God, the churches, the brides of Christ, all, the bride of Christ all throughout the world in the kingdom of God preach and teach the gospel every Sunday, every time they meet, every time they go, they scatter the seed, the good word that one of the four might respond. Four soils, three servants. If you're a servant of God, say amen. 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 Careful what you say. Turn with me back to Matthew now. Matthew in chapter 25. Matthew in chapter 25 now beginning in verse 14. You say you're the good soil. You've received the word and a, I would say according to your gratitude, you will produce fruit. And God says that one out of four are likely to be saved, but two out of three servants are actually obedient. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. This is a parable as well. Parables are stories meant to teach a spiritual lesson. Amen? There's only one parable told in the New Testament that is a true story. And that is the story, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You say, no, I think that's just a parable too. Well, find me any other parable where Jesus mentions somebody by name. Jesus was speaking specifically of a man named Lazarus. No, not the one that rose again. The one that was received into Abraham's bosom. The one that was saved. But this is a spiritual story told to teach a spiritual lesson. For the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, uh, one interpretation is 
these, these are the Jews, that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Amen? As Jesus Christ in his first advent uh, came into Jerusalem, surely they did say, Hosanna in the highest. Praise God for the son of David. But they received him as a conquering tink, uh, king, not a, a saving Christ. He's coming back as a conquering king, rest assured in that. But he came unto his own. And today what I'd like to do is apply this spiritually to the child of God, or at least the professing child of God, those who have been called into this heaven, bought by the blood of Christ, or at least profess to be bought by the blood of Christ. He says, he was traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. He gave them his money to take care of. Now, count Count the servants. And to one, he gave five talents. Talents is a, a form of currency uh, in the, by the way of silver. And, two, and, and another, two. And another, one talent. To every man, according to his uh, own ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, again, I think everybody's able to be fruitful. Just how fruitful you are is up to to you and how you respond to God in gratitude for what he's done for you. If you say, oh, well, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. I know that. You can speak about it so flippantly that the Son of God, the sinless man, poured out his blood on purpose for you? And you could just say, well, yeah, sure, I know about that. Well, I tell you what, you're probably not very fruitful. Because when I begin to ponder the work of Christ on the cross even up to the cross. Mm. Yes, he gave one, five talents, one, two talents, and one, one talent. Verse 16. Then, the, uh, then he that received the five talents went and traded it, uh, with traded the same, and made them another five talents. Oh man, he doubled his money. He doubled his money. That's amazing. And likewise, he that had received two talents, he also gained another two, again, doubling the money. He does. That's 100% profit. I like that. Now, I'm a capitalist. I'm not a very good capitalist. Like I say, I just gave everything away in my house. Very few things that I haggle with. But I won't lie. When I thought something was worth something, I made sure I got something. We had uh, a sofa and a love seat that we've had for 22 years that have only really been sat on for 22 Christmases. When my wife told my son-in-law that she was going to be selling the, that furniture, he goes, you're going to give away the Christmas furniture? <laughs> it's in the piano room where Kim does her piano, and it's like a little lady's thing in there. But when the neighbor came over, and he asked me what I wanted for him, and I said, well, how about 75? And then he brought his mother over thinking I was going to just, you know, just melt like wax because his mama was there. And she goes, will you, get, will you take 60? I said, maybe 70. Why? Because it was worth something. I know what the furniture's worth. I know what we paid for it. But I know that it was barely set on. No, I'm not. I, I, I am a capitalist. just not very good at it, except when it comes to my wife's furniture. But it goes on, likewise, that he received two, also gained another two. But he who had received one, now here's the key. There's four soils, three servants. What are you today? But he received one, and he went and he digged in the earth, and he hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came back and reckoned with them, or he settled the accounts. And so he had received five talents, came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five more talents. Fruitful. Fruitful. His Lord said unto him, Well, thou good and faithful servant, praise God. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You know how amazing that is to me? You, you know, in a world where people shirk and shun responsibility, in God's kingdom, he says, if you're faithful, I'll make you responsible for more. 
responsible for more. Again, I, I, I worked at a grocery store for 20 years. We have a lot of new people here, so they may not know that. You, you know what? Well, most of the guys I knew that wanted to be promoted were looking to do less. They, they, they wanted influence, but no responsibility. They wanted, they wanted to be the boss, but they didn't want to do anything. I never had respect for people like that. I'm a doer. I like getting in there and doing things. Maybe, maybe that's why I walk with a limp now, because I've done too much. But listen to me. We, we, we should be looking for what God wants us to do. Asking Him, what is it that you want me to do? Hey, not saying, God, you let me know what you need me to do, and I'll surely show up. First of all, there's, there's something doctrinally and biblically wrong about that statement. For one, we don't do God favors. For two, God is in need of nothing. So what should our prayer and our desire be? God, help me to do what I need to do for your honor and your glory and your kingdom. God, help me to be the man I need to be for my wife and my children and my grandchildren. For your honor, my, uh, your glory and my good and their blessing. God, help me to be the Christian I need to be for your kingdom, for your people, for your honor, and for your glory. What servant are you today? He digged, he, heard the mo he hid the money, but this one, he, he gave five, doubled it, and he says, Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents, but I gained two others besi uh, talents beside these. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I got some time here. Hey, you know one of the ways I apply this? Once again, being careful to know that all Scripture has one interpretation, but many applications. In the millennial kingdom, and I firmly believe there will be a thousand years that we will rule and reign on this planet as born-again, risen, glorified Christians in immortal bodies. Well, one of the ways I apply this servant, uh, not this servant, but well, apply this verse into my life as a servant to God is how faithful have I been here at 4401 South Nellis Boulevard? How faithful have I been here? I have laid my root down. I have planted a stake. There is no swimming back. I am hard pressed toward the goal. And you know what? I pray that this is what the Lord says to me. And when I enter into the joy of my Lord, into that time, I pray that he multiplies the area that he gives me to bring him honor and glory in. You too can claim that for yourself. We rob ourselves from blessings based on our finite view of things. Especially, and here's the key, our finite view of God. Because that was this servant's problem. He didn't have the fear of the Lord, the reverence and awe. He, and I, I can only imagine, might have been afraid to fail. Afraid to not do as well. Afraid that he might lose that even which what God had given him. And you know what that kind of faith has? That fear-filled faith? Scaredy cat faith? That scaredy cat faith has even what God had given him to be taken away. Let's look and see. Verse 23, he says, I'll make you a ruler over many things. I'll enter the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. He says, I know you're shrewd. You're, you're like Gordon Gecko. You can make money out of nothing. And he says, I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there has that this is, my, that this is thine. He says, I, I brought you what you gave me back. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Let that sink in for a second. Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou knowest that I reap where I sow not, and gathereth 
where I have not strawed. He says, listen, you know I have abundance. You know I have everything. He says, but you know what? Thou oughtest therefore to at least put the money to the exchange, to put my money to the exchange. He says, you should have at least put it in the bank. You know, if you put your money in the bank, or let's put it this way, if you put your God's money in the bank, it at least earn 0.01%. That used to be able to buy you a cup of coffee, not anymore. But at least it would have matriculated a bit. He says, you ought to put my money in the bank. And then at my coming, I should have received mine with the interest or the usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that which hath ten talents. You see that? <laughs> you see that? He says, take from the one who refuse to be fruitful for whatever reason and give it to the one that has. Now the one that had five talents doesn't just have 10, he's got 11. That's more. For everyone, verse 29, are you, are you with me? Say amen. amen. This is key. For unto everyone that shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not, he that hath not, shall be taken away even that which he has. That's what your Bible says. It's red letter in my Bible. That means it's the word of Christ. Then he goes and he says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, I could go on and on and on. Can we talk for a second? I, I, I've told you before, I grew up in the 80s, and I remember. I remember the televangelists. They're still there. They're just they're smarter than the ones in the 80s. They learned. They call, they say, send this in. We'll send you a napkin. Put, pray over it. Miracles will happen. They say, buy my books, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they, they, they're just... Uh, I think they just want your money. I don't know their hearts, but that doesn't resemble anything in the New or Old Testament that I could see. How can I express this, Lord? When I was in high school, there was a saying in our, in our weight room. I went to the old Vegas high school downtown. Our weight room was like a dungeon. But I love that because you know what? I was in there for one reason. It wasn't a fashion show. We are in there to get some work done, push the weight around, get better, and get out. But we had a saying above the door. And on that door it said, everything that you do not give today, you will lose forever. And every time I went through that doorway, I looked at that and I thought, I don't really feel like doing this today. I don't want to put another five pounds, two and a half on each side. I'm tired. I want to go home. I'm hungry. Put the other two and a half on each side. Let's get it done. Push it up. Harder, faster. Give it all. Give it all. Why? Because what you don't give today, you're going to lose forever. You know why? You don't get today back. You don't get today back. And as God started to implant these little lessons in my life, and I, I watched that silly movie, Gattaca, uh, I started to realize, oh, right, we're not going to get this life back. Yes, we have a new life. Yes, we have eternal life. But we have one life. We have one life to live now in Christ. And we have one opportunity to be fruitful and be counted as good and faithful servants. Notice again, like last week, the message comes after the offering plate has gone by. What you did not give today, you lose forever. That counts in your time. That counts in your money. That counts in your talent, your literal talents. That counts in your devotion to God. Mark it down and make no mistake about it. God 
forget about riches here on earth. Moth and rust will destroy these. But God is about making a place for you. He says, I go away to prepare a place for you that where I go, you may be also. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Francis, I love it. I'm going to get a mansion. But he says, store, store not up for yourselves treasures on earth that moth and rust can destroy and devour, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in two or three people understand that. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. People, I don't want your money. I don't want anything from you. I don't want anything from you. God has at least given me this part of his heart. And he did it first through my wife and children, and now my grandchildren, and he's had me apply it to his people at Desert Hills Baptist Church. I don't want anything from you, but I want everything for you. I want everything for you. Call you into a greater obedience. For you, not for me. Call you into greater degrees of holiness. Not holy unto thou, but holy unto God. Call you into greater degrees of righteousness. Not self-righteousness. Not so you can lengthen the hem of your garment like the Pharisees. But righteousness unto God. That your faith and truly Jesus Christ can so shine in your life that guess what? You might get, be given an opportunity to spread some seed. That you might be given an opportunity to become fruitful. Double, triple, matriculate all of God's blessings in your life for everyone around you. You say, well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have a lot of talent. I, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of time. And I certainly don't have a lot of money. Get a lot of Jesus. Get a lot of Jesus. And then see what happens. Because I want to remind you, you can't do anything apart from Christ. But I and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us.